Welcome to this introduction to network analysis. The purpose of this presentation is to provide a very quick introduction to network analysis with a particular focus on practices in the historical sciences. It is divided into five short chapters, which obviously cannot be exhaustive, but which aim to arouse curiosity to go further. The first chapter presents network analysis and its main concepts. As a preamble, I, I propose an example that allows you to understand how analyzing a structure is different from any other statistical analysis. It gives context around the element we are studying. In this very simple example, which allows us to approach the way we graphically represent the graph, here, two vertices connected by an edge represent an undirected relation between two elements. It is a type of representation that we are used to because we often see it around us. A metro map, an airline advertisement, a network of connected objects, etc. This kind of graph can be a network of people, organizations, places, objects, etc. For the purpose of this demonstration, imagine that it is about two people writing letters to each other. This relation therefore represents a certain number of letters, say 10, and, and we can obviously qualitatively analyze the content of these letters between these two peoples. But they can also be placed in the context of other letters written and received. As soon as we add the other people who correspond with our two subjects, we realize that some of them can be common relations. It's very interesting to know that there are people in this example three who can make the link or be the bridge between the two people in the center. Of course, these neighbors can also have relationships with each other, regardless of the relation between the subject of our analysis. And knowing that these relationships exist is very important to take some distance to realize that even if it's the two highlighted individuals that interest us, they are not the only factors of relationship. They are not necessarily the center by default. This decentralization is even stronger in a situation where people can send and receive letters without ever having a connection with the two people we are interested in. Uh, it's an additional level of context. And so these neighbors and neighbors can also have neighbors, etc. And we can imagine going much further than that. It all depends on the corpus of our archive we, we are working on. To make you understand how important the context is to understand the specific relationship, these 10 letters, let's imagine that it appears in different situations, structurally speaking. These four graphs all contain exactly the same number of people and the same number of relationships or letters exchanged but they are not distributed in the same way. Here, we understand that this relationship, highlighted in blue, uh, takes on a completely different meaning if these 10 letters are exchanged at the center of the network, built around our two people at the top left, or if they connect to groups that have nothing else in common at the top right, or if these relationships uh, take place in a group that is not connected to other groups at the bottom right. Uh, the content of these 10 letters between these two people never change, so that if we limit ourselves to analyzing them qualitatively, the interpretation will always be, always be exactly the same, but the context of appearance is so different that we can give them another meaning or another status. There is something else interesting about these four situations. In fact, these four situations are a version of Anscombe's Quartet adapted uh, to network analysis. In his 1973 article, Francis Anscombe shows that it is important to visualize data even though it is more popular in the field of statistics to rely only on calculations. He shows that four datasets with very different distributions have identical statistical characteristics. Same mean, same variance, same correlation and linear regression line, etc. If we rely only on statistics to interpret these data sets, we miss a very important information. As I said, these four networks are all composed of the same number of vertices and edges. So they, they have the same density, but above all, the number of connection of each vertex is always di distributed in the same way. There, there is always a vertex which has eight connections, two vertices which have seven, etc. So if we simply produce a simple statistical report about these networks, we are missing out on extremely important structural information. Uh, this remark is therefore an encouragement to visualize the networks, or at least it allows to nuance the sometimes very strict positions that say that the purity of numbers, mathematics, and statistics does, 
not need graphic representation imperfect by nature. In fact, we know that graphic representation is problematic and that visualizations are sometimes inadequate to make our subject clearer for our readers, but it is a very useful exploration tool to understand the data. Obviously, the forest situation we have here are very simple and caricatural. What happens if we extend our example and imagine that our archive contains thousands of letters between thousands of correspondents? This is when we will have to find new ways to read a network, because a complex network of several hundred vertices is already difficult to read. It is even more difficult, difficult when there are thousands or tens of thousands, as here. This complex and massive network, this impenetrable galaxy, is what we call the hairball or a big spaghetti monster. We see groupings, clusters, less dense regions, but we cannot read it with our eyes. We will need mathematics to decipher it. This does not mean that this graphical representation of these hundreds of thousands of relationships is not useful. It means that it will not be used in the same way. It is not a research result as such, it is an exploration interface. Now, this preamble was intended to show the essence of network analysis, which is to analyze a structural context. But let's get back to the basics of terminology. Basically, the object we manipulate, the graph, is composed of points and lines, usually called vertices or nodes, connected by edges or arcs. It is an extremely simple way to represent a relationship between two elements, a very high level of abstraction. As a result, we have to be very careful about what we put behind these abstractions. Real-life situation cannot be reduced to such abstractions except at a high price, that of an extreme simplification. This is called data modeling, the creation of a model that can be applied systematically. If we are aware of the reduction of complexity that this induces, and that we can therefore be critical of this process, then this systematic approach allows us to use all the tools of graph theory with great efficiency. If the vertices of the network are generally quite easy to define when modeling individuals, organizations, objects, etc., the choice of the type of relationship is more critical. An edge can be undirected or directed, but it can also be reciprocal, which does not necessarily have the same meaning as undirected. In general, we study graphs in which the relations are encoded in the same way, but our modeling may lead us to situations where some relations have direction, a sent letter, for example, and other do not, like a friendship relation. Uh, um, it is important to note that in most empirical research network, relationships can be weighted, they will be represented with more or less thickness, depending on the intensity of the relationship, or if the same relationship appears several times uh, uh, in a row. More rarely represented graphically, but sometimes very real, self-loops are also possible. Let us now look at the qualification of the different situations that we find when these vertices and edges are connected. We distinguish, for example, connected graphs from disconnected graphs. The first ones are made of a single component. We can find a path between all the vertices of the graph. Disconnected graphs are composed of several components. It sounds like completely obvious detail, but, it, but the fact that a network is continuous or divided into several components is rarely discussed in paper when they're not purely theoretical. Usually, only the main component is connected, is commented on, forgetting the, the vertices that are not connected to the largest group. Um, if all the vertices of the graph have connections with all the others, we speak of a complete graph. This is rarely the case in real network analysis situation, but it allows us to discuss the completeness of the network by comparing it to a perfect, complete situation. Uh, the search for a Complete graphs is also expressed in the long tradition of detecting cliques, which are those regions of the graph where all vertices are connected to each other and thus form groups of max maximum density. The graph on the left here contains one four click and five three clicks, triangles uh, joining three vertices. When the removal of a vertex would result in the disconnection of two components of the graph, it is called the bridge. The detection of such bridges is very important for the evaluation of the robustness of a network. We will come back to this. If we now come to the categorization of network types, we distinguish two main families, one-mode networks, which are compos composed of a single set of vertices, and two-mode networks, which contains 
two different sets of vertices. It is not the nature of these vertices that is important, but their structural characteristic. In a two-mode network, which is basically a biparted graph, there is a connection only between nodes of a different type. To take an example, we can very well represent people, organizations, objects, concepts in the form of a single one-mode network, with relation between all these elements. But if we want to formally analyze the affiliation between individuals and institutions, for example, we are only interested in this vertical relationship between vertices of a different type, and lo no longer in the relationships between the individual dancers. This is an important distinction. Most of the time, we use two-mode modeling to produce one-mode graphs, which are then easier to analyze. Without going into too much detail on this point, which could be the subject of an entire course, obviously, uh, here are some elements concerning the format formatting of, of data. Basically, a network is an adjacency matrix, as you can see below, which it allows you to read the relation between all vertices. Note that this, in this matrix, the relationships are directed. It must be read from, from left to right and, and weighted here. You, you see values 1 and 2. Such a matrix may be sufficient for us to analyze small to medium-sized graphs, but the encoding itself is usually done with a simplified list of relations, as seen on the left in the edges column. On the first line, we uh, read that vertex 1 is linked to vertex 2 by a relation of size 1. A list of vertices here on the left gives us the key to decrypt uh, the identifiers as well as additional variables, such as a label to display or attributes to sort the vertices. This matrix and this adjacency list both give us the small network on the right. If the interpretation of the metrics provided by graph theory will be discussed in more detail in a following ch chapter, we must nevertheless mention the principle here. To explain how these centrality measures are calculated, let us take a very simple network. Here, it is duplicated to compare the results of the calculation. The darker a point, the higher the score. The point highlighted in blue is the vertex of the graph that gets the highest value. At the top left, we find the degree centrality, a metric that is easy to understand since it consists in counting the number of connections of each vertex. If we are still talking about network of letters, then this value is simply the number of people who correspond with the selected individual. Here, the highest score is reached by individual A, who has seven connections. In this conception of centrality, an individual is central if he has many connections. At the bottom left, we find the closeness centrality. It consists in measuring how far are all the vertices of the, of the graph from each other. The one who has the smallest average distance with all the others is therefore the one who is closest to all the others on average. Here, vertex C has the greatest mean proximity. Uh, in this conception of centrality, an individual is central if he is in the middle of the graph uh, in terms of overall topography. At the top right, the betweenness centrality consists in detecting all the shortest path between the vertices of the graph, and then counting how many times a vertex is on the path between two others. We can therefore say that the most central individuals, according to these measures, are those who connect different parts of the network that would be not necessarily be connected to each other. Uh, they are the bridges, the information carriers. Here uh, it is vertex B, which is most often uh, uh, on the path between all the possible pairs of vertices. In the case of our correspondence network analysis, we would probably not focus on this vertex B, but the betweenness centrality reminds us that uh, it is the only path to five vertices of the graph above it uh, on this image, which represent 25% here. In the next chapters, we'll see that the interpretation we can make of this statistical and structural information depend on how our data has been extracted from historical sources. As a conclusion to this introductory cha chapter, I, I would like to continue our terminology exercise, but also applying it to uh, these sometimes unclear concepts. Uh, they are often mixed, and this is normal since science is an iterative and above all uh, social and cultural process. Concepts are produced without uh, there always being a consensus on the definition on uh, or on what field really uh, it really covers. However, the difference between a graph and a network is quite simple. The graph is an abstract mathematical object, while the network is its concrete counterpart. This means that when you want to analyze a network, you model it as a graph. And once you have analyzed it with the tools of graph theory, you translate the results into the language of your object, your network. 
The difference between network science, network analysis, and social network analysis is more subtle since these concepts seem to be interchangeable. But in fact, even if they describe things that overlap to a large extent, these, con these concepts are positioned uh, at, a, at different levels. Network analysis is the analysis of network data, it is a technical practice, whereas social network analysis is much closer to the phenomena that creates these networks. It is the analysis of the phenomenon, not only of its data. For its part, network science is a field of research, almost a discipline, which has evolved towards the study of complex networks. The same could be uh, said of net historical network research. It is a community of practice around a set of methods and tools.